Good evening and a warm welcome uh, to all of you uh, who are here today to attend the second Yoda Elkana uh, Prize event. The workshop we've already started with some of you during the day. We are continuing it tonight with a lecture by Uday Mehta, who has received the Yoda Elkana Prize. He is the second recipient of the prize. The first, some of you may recall, was Helga Novotny last year. Um, I'll just say something about the prize in a moment, say something about Yehuda Elkana, and then hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Roger Berkowitz, to say something about Ude and uh, this evening's talk. I'd like to warmly welcome um, Mr. Jaydeep Mazumdar and Parvati Mazumdar. Uh, Jaydeep Mazumdar is the Indian ambassador here, and I'm very pleased to have you with us this evening. So there walks in Robert Skidelsky, Lord Skidelsky, whom I would like to greet, an old friend of um, the university and who's given uh, talks here uh, before as well. This, uh, the Oda Elkana uh, Prize, which uh, we have awarded you and we're very happy that you've accepted it, is in memory of Yehuda Elkana, the CEU's third rector president. He was the longest serving rector that the CEU has had for a decade from 1999 to 2009. Uh, he was uh, the president of the uh, university. The prize was an idea uh, which was born in a conversation between Roger, um, uh, my colleague at the IWM, the Institute of Human Sciences, which I used to direct in Vienna before I moved here, Ivan Krastev, um, and um, Lenny Bernardo, the vice president of the uh, OSF. We were considering what kind of an initiative we could start within the framework of the Open Society University Network um, between the CEU, the um, IWM and the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard. It was at Rogers Initiative. He came down specially to have a discussion with us in Vienna. And uh, Ivan and I, who were very close uh, to Yehuda, Yehuda was a friend, a mentor. He was the one who brought me here uh, 20 years ago, uh, 22 years ago, actually, to um, establish the sociology and anthropology department at the university, we decided that it would be um, important to do something in his uh, memory. Yoda was curious in the uh, extreme, and um, he was a historian, a philosopher, historian of science, uh, an internationally renowned scholar whose work travels many disciplines. He was an Auschwitz survivor, for those of you who don't know Yehuda's um, uh, biography. And he was a great educationist, interested broadly in questions of um, reforming universities uh, as institutions and reforming their curricula in the 21st uh, century. So we decided we will couple the prize uh, with uh, at least a week's stay at the university for the recipient of the prize, giving you a chance to interact with our students and faculty. But we would couple it with what we uh, thought would be an interesting way of discussing ongoing work, not finished work, but work in progress so that the prize giver has a chance to bring a whole group of people together, people whom he or she would like to discuss their ongoing work with, and that can feed into then the final manuscript. The idea for this kind of a workshop originates with my conversation with Robert Skidelsky, who told me that he had profited enormously from these kinds of workshops about manuscripts which were in progress, and we thought we would steal Robert's idea, and therefore I'm particularly happy uh, to have him uh, uh, with us uh, today. Um, let me very quickly uh, say a couple of words um, about Yehuda and Gandhi, because there is something interesting um, there, which um, I think uh, would, be, would bear repeating since the prize uh, was instituted in his uh, memory. Uh, so uh, maybe one personal anecdote, um, 
I once asked Yehuda if he had any regrets in life as uh, somebody who had, uh, who was an Auschwitz survivor, who at the age of 11 um, uh, took his own parents, took the decision to take his own parents to uh, Israel, um, uh, then uh, went to uh, university, not only in Israel, but also in the US and had a long and distinguished academic career, both in Europe and uh, in Israel. And he said, yes, he did have one minor regret, and that is not to have become a professional musician. And I said, what would you have wanted to play? And he said, Shalini, I would have liked to have been a conductor. And I don't know why, I just said quite spontaneously, I said, Yehuda, but you are a conductor. What you are doing is basically conducting everybody else's lives. And one of the things you do is to bring people together, to work together, think together. And the one of your major contributions, I think, will be uh, your work as an institution builder, which is very much about conducting people's lives. And then he said, okay, then I don't even have that regret anymore. <laughs> the photograph that you see here before you is an odd photograph. It's Yehuda's last gift to me. It's the month before he passed away. And uh, he said, it's a challenge, this one. It's two friends of yours, and you have to now recognize them from the back. <laughs> it's Shmuel Eisenstadt and Yehuda Elkana taking a walk in Grindelwald uh, in Switzerland. And uh, it was a photograph uh, that a friend of his discovered by accident, and then we uh, blew it up. And this was the last gift I have uh, from Yehuda. And I thought it's an interesting photograph. He would have welcomed your seeing his, and uh, Shmuel Eisenstadt was a very, very close friend of his. So you would, he would have welcomed uh, your seeing both of them uh, retreating uh, rather than to have his face projected on the uh, uh, screen. Um, what uh, can I tell you uh, about Yehuda? Yehuda um, turned this university into a really cosmopolitan uh, international uh, university, a first-class research uh, university. Um, and he did that with not only a remarkable zest for institution building, a zest for life, but also with a delightful sense of humor. Um, one of his major contributions, and we used to say this to our founder, uh, to um, uh, Mr. George Soros, we said, you hire a director, but you also got a cook in the process. Yehuda was as passionate about operas and about science as he was about cooking. So I spent as many hours cooking in his kitchen, discussing books um, and ideas as I did in uh, uh, sort of academic discussions with him. To Yehuda and Gandhi, a very interesting anecdote. Yehuda was going to India for the first time rather late in life. And I get a phone call to say, I need to borrow some books um, on Gandhi. The library doesn't have what I need. And I recall that your mother was one of the translators of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. So I said the collected works is 98 volumes. And I don't have them here. They're in Ahmedabad in my parents' home. But maybe you want to start with Hint Swaraj. And he somehow didn't like Hint Swaraj. Um, he's, he just couldn't get into it. And then he said, is there anything else I can read? And I said, yes, uh, why not the autobiography, um, uh, his experiments, my experiments with truth. So I gave him the autobiography and he had this disconcerting habit of calling up at quarter to seven, seven in the morning, uh, knowing that that's the worst possible time to have a conversation with me. And for the next three weeks, every morning, he would call up to say, I'm reading my experiments with truth in parallel with the Mahabharat. I said, why the Mahabharat? He said, I decided I want to look at the book which discusses violence in India together with um, uh, Gandhi's uh, biography. So of course I had to reread the Mahabharat and uh, many conversations uh, followed and among some of the most interesting ones there then because you know I had a very limited understanding of the Mahabharat I fished out for Yehuda who was very, very interested in Israel and Israeli politics, uh, um, the two letters of Martin Buber uh, to Gandhi 
which remained unanswered. And then I fished out from here for him what Gandhi had written uh, in his two letters to Hitler. And those became the subjects of many, many conversations um, um, uh, uh, among us, uh, between us those days. And then he sent to me a piece, which if you have not had a look at it, it may be interesting to read. In 1988, Yehuda published a piece, a very controversial and a provocative piece in Haaretz, the uh, Israeli um, uh, daily uh, newspaper, and um, in which uh, he decided to speak out against the Israeli state's politics of memorialization of the Holocaust. And he was making the argument, or he was making two arguments. Uh, one of the arguments was, is, and I quote him here, I found the piece again. He says, the past is not and must not be allowed to become the dominant element determining the future of society and the destiny of the people. For our part, we must learn to forget. And this, as you can imagine, caused a huge uproar um, in uh, Israel. But Gandhi then, I mean, so Yehuda said to me, I think it's very, very important that our societies learn to forget. And then the whole question was of what does collective memory and memorialization consist of and what kind of a national history uh, do we need and why the idea that a nation without a history could be a happier uh, nation. So uh, this was um, a long uh, conversation with him. And the other was when I gave him the Gandhi Dagor correspondence on uh, nationalism, which he read with great interest. And then he went uh, to also visit uh, uh, Shantini Ketan. I think he would have enormously enjoyed your uh, really, really rich and exciting manuscript. And if he would have been here, he would have not only been thrilled by the lecture on political rationality, he would have actually invited all of us to dinner in his home. Now that's something which I'm unfortunately not going to do without Yehuda. I don't dare to cook for 30 or 40 people anymore. But I think that should give you some flavor of the kind of person in whose memory the prize is instituted, of which we are very proud to have you, Ude, as the recipient. So a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much, Shalini. Um, I'm Roger Berkowitz, and I'm really uh, thrilled to be here at the Central European University. Uh, as Shalini said, this prize in honor of Yehuda Elkana came up of a conversation between her and Ivan Krastov and myself. And we really wanted to create a prize and a fellowship. And we started with a prize and it became sort of also this fellowship where we would have a, a month here. And um, where we would bring people together to talk about uh, a manuscript, something that was in process by someone who we felt uh, uh, would would represent uh, the spirit of curiosity, intelligence, intellect, the humanities, and society that um, Yudel Akana stood for. I, I never met him, um, but I've heard so much about him in the last few years that I feel a great kinship to him. And um, as Shalini said, what I've heard so much about is his love for cooking and entertaining and genia or hospitality, I think was the word used a lot last year. And if for no other reason, I think that makes uh, Uday Singh Mehta uh, an a, a, a incredibly uh, appropriate recipient of the Yehuda Elkana Prize and Fellowship this year. He's one of the most hospitable uh, people I've ever come across in my life. Uh, loves to cook, loves to entertain. He has a life of the mind and a life of collegiality and of friendship that I think often don't go together. And I think maybe very much are in the spirit of Yehuda Elkana. Um, I first met Uday uh, when we were both teaching together at Amherst College a number of years ago. And um, I think we both felt a little out of place at times and gravitated towards each other with another one of our colleagues, Jeff Ferguson. Um, uh, I read his book at the time, his second book. His first book was Anxiety of Freedom on 
on John Locke. I didn't read that till much later, but his first book was liberal or second book was liberalism and empire. And it's one of those books, one of those few books written in the last century um, that really had changed my life. Uh, I came to see it as really one of the most important and greatest books of, of political theory that I had ever come across. And I teach it and, and require all my students to read it. Um, what is so great about that book is it, it really sheds, uh, I mean, on many levels, uh, a light on democracy as a universe, as an imperialist project um, and liberal democracy as an imperialist project. Uh, and reminds us, therefore, that liberalism and much of what we often call liberalism or progressivism um, can actually be quite oppressive and violent uh, and, and one-sided. And that it reminds us, the hero of that book in, in many ways is Edmund Burke. And it reminds us that a kind of um, conservatism can at times uh, be more respectful of, of other peoples and other ways of life than, than liberalism can. And it's that kind of, it's a deeply historical book. It's a big, it, it engages in uh, a number of political figures, John Mill and Edmund Burke and others. Uh, it, it engages in the history of India. Um, and yet it's, it's an original look that I think for many people and not just myself changed our understanding of liberalism not to mention uh, empire. Um, as such, he's really one of the most, I think, influential and important critics of the liberal tradition of political thought today. And we're here today um, just to read, we're here this week to read and tonight specifically to hear about a new book, which is in process, he has a manuscript for it called A Different Vision, Gandhi's Critique of Political Rationality. And in this book, Uday unearths a non-liberal politics. We've been talking about to what extent it is a politics and what that means that rejects both imperialism and nationalism. Um, in one of his uh, chapters in an, in an earlier lecture, Uday says, and I quote, in a sense for Gandhi, courage and fearlessness were portals for a sort of spiritual truancy which he sought to plant in the very midst of the mundane patterns of everyday life. Courage and fearlessness were a sort of, sort of spiritual truancy. It's that interest in and ability to articulate a spiritual truancy. Uh, an intellectual truancy, I think, when anyone who's had a conversation with Uday knows that it's, it does plant intellectual truant thoughts in your head. Um, he constantly makes you think differently, constantly surprises you. He's never predictable. And um, one of the most honest and um, thoughtfully exciting thinkers I've ever come across. So it's my great honor today to introduce Uday Mehta as the Yehuda Okana uh, fellowship award for 2022. Thanks very much. Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you for your overly generous introduction. And thank you, Shalini. Um, I want to start my lecture by two anecdotes. Uh, I did meet Yehuda Elkanah. I met him in the last year of his life uh, in Budapest. Uh, and I recall him in just the way you spoke of him. Alas, I never ate food that he cooked. Um, the other thing I want to uh, bring up is um, uh, these two letters uh, that Martin Buber wrote to him, wrote to Gandhi, which I, uh, I discussed in this manuscript. 
And uh, they also relate to this theme of fearlessness. And uh, uh, I think it was 1936 uh, when a number of people asked uh, Gandhi what he thought of what was going on in Europe. And Gandhi gave this interesting answer. Um, he started by condemning Hitler, but then he said, um, the Jewish people, even if they cannot survive, their death can be meaningful. And the way that death can be meaningful is if they are prepared to collectively die. But the condition of that is they must not wait for others to support them. So he made death a dignified thing. And on this, Martin Buber wrote to him and said, ah, it's not acceptable. You're asking a particular group of people to kill themselves or allow themselves to be killed. And uh, I don't think Gandhi ever re replied to that letter, but for me, that letter is significant precisely because it makes the theme of fearlessness and death central to his thinking. Uh, it was admittedly a very, very controversial letter. Uh, some of his closest friends said, this is outrageous, outrageous, what you're asking the Jewish people to do. But the way I interpret it, it was one of many uh, courageous acts of Gandhi. He never, never played to the gallery. Uh, uh, so those are the two uh, episodes I want to recall. Now, as Roger said, uh, the theme of my manuscript uh, is a different vision. It's, it's entitled A Different Vision, Gandhi's Critique of Modern Political Rationality. I want to start by offering you two quotations from Gandhi. The first is, the function of violence is to obtain reform by external means. The function of soul force is to obtain growth from within, which in turn obtain, is, is, is obtained by self-suffering and self-purification. The second quote is the chief characteristic of modern civilization is the worship of the body more than the spirit. It, that is modern civilization, gave every Thing, uh, uh, gave to everything a glorification of the body. Modern civilization, in modern civilization, railways, telegraphs, telephones are a form of that glorification. This book, uh, or this, the draft of this book, is as the title suggests, a critique of modern political rationality and the civilization it spawned since the 17th century. That civilization had a particular way of conceptualizing nature and the world and a distinctive narrative to understand the challenges that attended it. In this, the skeleton form of that narrative 
can be expressed in the four following points, all of which are simplifications, or as Weber would call them, ideal types. First, that politics pertains to the interaction among individuals and states, and not to individuals in solo. The fact that politics relates only to the interaction among individuals and states also means that it is largely indifferent to that which is in the individual's interest or what one might call his or her quality integrity. Second, that politics necessarily involves instrumental forms of reasoning and acting. It is only by being in principle instrumental that politics concern itself, can concern itself with the various contingencies that pertain to public life. And only thus can it advance the interests of the whole, that is public interest, which undergird the normative basis of political society. Moreover, this instrumentalism fundamentally marks the status of the citizen. He or she must accept being part of a universe in which the contingencies that affect the advancement of the whole necessarily refract his or her understanding as a citizen. The citizen must therefore have a sacrificial self-understanding. Because at the limit, citizenship is a form <coughs> of soldiering in which, as they say, one must be prepared to die so that others can live. Mod modern politics, as Weber famously conjectured, may have triumphed by only disenchanting the world and rid ridding it of magic. But in another sense, it imbued every moment with the mysterious quality, quality because it, it can only be a, 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 a assessed by reference to some interminable calculus of collective benefits and collective security. The third feature, which relates to the point about instrumentalism and the point that is to follow, pertains directly to violence. Politics cannot foreclose on the use of violence without also giving up the cons its constitutive commitment to public interest. The absolutism of politics, namely <clears throat> uh, absolutism of politics, namely a commitment to securing individual and public interest, Require, requires a commensurate absolutism of the means. And those in principle, and often in fact, must include a warrant to deploy violence. Weber's definition of the state having a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence is largely just a blunt restatement of the more general claim that if, if uh, uh, the public interest is to have an overriding priority, the state must have the means to assert that priority. Sim violence simply cannot be proscribed in principle. The final feature of modern political thinking is what might be called its inherent idealism. In being concerned with the public interest and with progress more generally, modern politics expresses an imperative energy to improve the world. Modern politics in its various ideological variants has always associated political power with that capacious imperative for the betterment of life. This is no less true in John Locke as it is in Marx, Mill 
and even roles. As with the other points I've made, a lot more needs to be said on this issue, including, of course, the, the, uh, in, including, of course, pointing to the various instruments through which liberals in particular have tried to limit the use of power. But even those efforts come from within the ambit of politics. All these aspects of modern political thinking troubled Gandhi because of the form of life they produced and its priorities and the link they had with modern civilization. In, a broad, in broad and specific ways, Gandhi thought of that civilization and that way of thinking as having a diminished view of human potential and the forms of living together. Gandhi is, of course, often thought of as a revolutionary. Yet on most matters, he was moderate in his actions. Or his actions just didn't fit the evaluatory framework we have. Most revolutionaries, because they are motivated by an opposition to some structure, which they claim cannot be reformed, but only radically changed or wholly destroyed, tend to be immoderate in the way they behave. Such was clearly the case with Lenin, Mao, Che Guevara, and others. It made them revolutionaries. It, 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 they, they were revolutionaries in, in their beliefs, and therefore, they were revolutionaries in their actions. In contrast, to say that Gandhi was revolutionary in his beliefs, and yet he acted in a moderate way, strains credibility. Much to the irritation of most Indians, he proudly described himself as a loyal subject of the British crown. In the febrile context of the widely regarded, the, the widely regarded apostle of nonviolence, he declared that Indians should vol volunteer to fight for the empire in Europe in the First World War. At the height of the Satyagraha movement, Satyagraha and non-cooperation movement, he called for individual and collective self-discipline. And moreover, when such discipline was lacking, he called off the movement altogether. When Indian independence was in sight, he said Indians should, be, should settle for being a dominion part of the empire. In the wake of the heinous, unprovoked killing of innocent people at Jallianwala Bagh, he suggested that General Dyer not be punished, but only relieved of his responsibilities. On the eve of independence, in a context of partition, he suggested that Jinnah be made the first Indian prime minister. Finally, there is an unmistakable tone of moderation in many of his writings. And in, sharp con in, in, uh, and in sharp contrast with his interlocutor in Hind Swaraj. How does one make sense of this paradoxical set of commitments? Gandhi was neither a conservative nor a progressive, nor despite the tensions, perhaps even contradictions, nor was he an alienated person who had to urge uh, who, had, who had the urge to conserve the past and protect it from the future. <clears throat> he transcended these distinctions and that transcendence made him an iconoclasm that had, uh, that had the marks of a deep spiritualism. Politics is now an extravagant way of thinking. Something like religion in earlier times 
politics has no outside. We have a political account of everything. This is true even of those who subscribe to a chastened view of politics. For example, liberals who make the domain of politics, who want to make the domain of politics uh, restricted. But even, because even the line between the political and the non-political is a political matter for them. This is obviously the case when one is thinking about different frameworks of politics, such as the generous entitlements of social democratic regimes or cultures, and others who believe that public assurances should be more limited. But all these specific distinctions, which are nestled and stem from distinct domains such as economics, urban studies, cultural studies, gender studies, political science, of course. Um, indeed, there is a proliferation of such distinctions, along with the constant struggle where the boundaries are to be set, are drawn, uh, but in a sense, these disputes, along with the constant struggle where the boundaries are, uh, but these disputes are in a sense be beside the point because the issue of where the boundaries get set is itself a political issue. Uh, so ideas like the personal is political or gender is a construction, these are now banal, uh, banal claims because they're part of a, a world in which these connections are assumed. Politics is now the table on which other cherished ideas and practices of the modern world rest. A concern, indeed, of obsession with security, a concern with identity, the importance of borders and boundaries, and many other issues that articulate the vision of nationalism, such as having a central font of power and sovereignty. These are all thought to be political matters. Correspondingly, all the problems that they refer to are deemed to have political solutions. The distinction between the household, the oikos, and the polis, on, which was the ground uh, of Aristotle's uh, uh, elaboration of uh, the rich elaboration of constitutional imagination now seems arcane and banal. This is not, it is not the case that there are, there were no antecedents to such a capacious view. There were. Most religions have a capacious ordering of the world. In fact, they typically have a more, a more extensive conception of order, which is why they often resort to, to, to things like uh, 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 to other sorts of terms like the soul, the afterlife, and ultimately God. In addition, there is a kind of civilizational thinking whose categories transcend particularities, the traces of which are evident in words such as Europe, Asia, Middle East. These were, and in some sense still are, categories that once referred to something imprecise. And now only through bureaucratic stipulation are they made to look precise. Gandhi had a deep and wide ranging critique of this capacious way of thinking and the actions that informed this perspective. He thought, he thought uh, this form of thinking reflected a specifically modern secular sensibility, whose central features were a salience on self-preservation, security, impatience, fear of death, and of course, a link with violence, to all of which he thought politics alone offered, could offer a credible redress. Gandhi's critique 
leads us to reconsider many of the main currents of modern political thought and practice. He questioned the nation state, even as he articulated a powerful set of objections to empire. He challenged the antithesis between political order and anarchy. In the idea of Satyagraha, he envisioned a form of change that relied on individual and collective self-discipline and, ethic and ethical resoluteness and not on mass action. Nor was, it, nor was it reliant on the logic of numbers. He championed patience and in doing so denied the imperative that underlies most forms of violence. And ultimately he questioned the very idea of sovereignty of the people or of the state by pointing to extant attitudes and practices that were dispersed and nestled in ongoing forms of life. Gandhi does not have an alternative argument, just an account of a world anchored, <coughs> uh, does not have an alternative argument, just an account of the world anchored in the idea of God can be offered against uh, the idea of a godless world. What he does have is a different vision of how life could be organized and lived. In a word, he has a different orientation which leans on some of the themes I have just mentioned. These themes are meant to capture Gandhi's discomfort with how modern politics is conceptualized and typically practiced. This itself constitutes a puzzle. How did a person who had such an unmistakable political influence also have a deep discomfort with the orientation of modern politics? One of the central purposes of this book is to illuminate this puzzle. It is also linked to why this, uh, this book does not have a single argument. Orientations cannot be argued against. They have to be accepted or dismissed. A bit like modern science, which did not for the most part often argue, or offer arguments against ancient and medieval science. Rather, it just changed the topic. Similarly, impressionist paintings did not offer an argument, uh, uh, did not offer arguments against rep representational art. It just proceeded to, it, 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 again, it made the former more persuasive and relevant. It changed the way we perceived the world. Gandhi hoped to bring about a similar radical reorientation towards the world we live in. This can, this can often feel disorienting because without the familiar supports and ways of thinking, as it were, <coughs> uh, 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 as it were, uh, we're trying to find our feet, which is what politics has given us. I think it is precisely this orientation, this feeling of walking without handrails, that in my opinion, makes Gandhi such a challenging thinker. Towards the beginning of his autobiography, Gandhi says, what I've been striving and pining for these past 30 years is self-realization. To see God face to face, to attain moksha. I live and move and have my being in pursuit of this goal. All that I do by way of speaking, writing, and all my ventures in the political field are directed at this goal, end of quote. The reason I privilege this passage is because in it, Gandhi explicitly links his political work to a spiritual goal and indicates the priority of the latter. If one asks what makes the goal spiritual, the answer is that it is spurred by the it, it is spurred 
by the desire for self-realization, which Gandhi elaborates in terms of wishing to quote, see God face to face and attaining moksha. The passage goes on to claim some things cannot be expressed in public because they are known only, quote unquote, to oneself and one's maker. These, he says, clearly cannot be communicated. In contrast, the experiments that his autobiography deals with are, quote unquote, spiritual and moral, which is, uh, which have a political aspect that can be discussed in public. But these experiments, as he calls them in his autobiography, deal with, <coughs> these are the experiments his autobiography deals with. He concludes the paragraph with the decisive, the declarative statement, quote, for the essence of religion is morality. Gandhi has been associated with more or less every major political event of the 20th century. With decolonization, the fight against racial apartheid, the critique of uh, war and violence, the critique of um, consumerism, of <clears throat> the violence of our unsustainable environmental abuse, a skepticism regarding the role of technology, and more generally, bringing the common man and woman into the field of public life. These associations have naturally engendered the view that he was in the main a political thinker, not simply that his views had political implications, but that he thought in political terms. That somehow his ideal itself was political. Yet Gandhi does something altogether different. His radical ideal, idealism stems from the connection he establishes between self-knowledge, that is seeing God face to face, and his public endeavors, all of which he identifies with the spiritual. It is telling that he makes no reference to the narrative of modern power and politics. He does this at least in part because he was not, he was not spurred or he did not share the tra trauma that underlies much of modern politics. In modern political thought and to a substantial degree in modern political practice, the governing image has been of being, uh, is of being precariously perched on a precipice where there is an imminent danger of falling, resulting in death and anarchy. The social and, and the religious are deemed to be altogether defunct, having lost their historical capacity to offer any resistance as an alternative model to this stark image of falling over a cliff. The family, religious community, friendships, con conventions and practices of social organizations individual self-discipline, in brief, the conviviality and conflict that mark everyday practices with their ethical density cannot retard, let alone obviate the fall into desolation and anarchy. The political, political power is always responding to an anxious anticipation to a kind of brutal <coughs> brutality with its limiting case being death. Ever since Hobbes declared this, that the center of fact of modern life was insecurity and fear, which could only be avoided by the redemptive power of the state and hence politics, security has been a central catechism of contemporary life. It is not merely that a concern with security has been the authorizing warrant for the perpetual motion of recent wars, or that security and not ideology in its traditional sense now underwrites a global vision that needs the buttress of far-flung garrisons. Like a contagious virus, it has now affected 
all the organizations, organs of modern society and individuals <coughs> to which the state alone offers the appropriate inoculation. At one level, this connectivity testifies to the new ways in which everything is connected, to the fact that the designation of quote-unquote separate spheres on which modern liberalism relied and on whose denial totalitarian prospered are increasingly tenuous distinctions. It is a fact, it is a familiar fact that officials routinely justify even the most mundane aspects of public policy by invoking the abstract idea of security. But security clearly connects the totalitarian and, and, and liberal regimes because both are instrumental in our expressions of a political mandate. Implicit in this normalization of a heightened regard for security, both individual and collective, is a concern with unity because it increases the prospect of clear identities and hence security on an emphasis on uh, norms such as toleration because they are deemed to be essential to coexistence, especially under conditions characterized by diversity, a devaluation of individual courage because all, it almost always puts self-preservation self at risk, a high valuation of technology because it is typically tied to, to, to tied with corporeal needs such as health and well-being. And finally, in a general way, in a general and progressive, uh, and finally, in a, and in a general um, uh, progressive, and in general, the progressive energy of the state, because it alone has the power to secure many of the things just mentioned. This political rationality finds expression in many things that characterize modern, modern civilization, specifically, uh, most conspicuously, in the idea that the state is the ultimate guarantor of order. Again, this is true of totalitarian regimes, the theocratic and liberal regimes, because they alone can claim to be sovereign. All other forms of order are reliant on the guarantees that the state offers. This is an important way. And this is another way of saying the social is now defunct. Whatever order it does supply is illusory. Ultimately, it cannot be relied on without an implicit or sometimes explicit reliance on the backstop of the state. Through a chain of nested dependencies, the state now underwrites all social connections because nothing is wholly independent of what it offers. It is like, like a building in which various rooms have an apparent solidity, but they are all reliant on having a firm foundation. This vision is in sharp contrast to the one offered by Gandhi. He did not give security either of individuals or of collectivities any priority. He did not privilege borders, identity, unity, or the nation state for that matter. Rather, he thought in civilizational terms. He did not think that toleration had to be va valued as an independent thing which required the vigilance of, and the mediation of the state. He placed high value on courage because it indicated a readiness for freedom and maturity. He was suspicious of technology because it facilitated a kind of vicarious existence. That is, it gave inducements to be and to live life as though it was somebody else's. In brief, he opposed and was suspicious of the sort of mediation and reliance on power especially the reliance on the power of the state and its institution. 
Gandhi valued the social in its various forms. The family, religion, the face-to-face -face practices, uh, face-to-face practices, depth, slowness, and patience, the singular, because in his views, in his views, these were the grounds for self-realization. In brief, these were the constituent parts of <clears throat> his spiritual vision. This had a profound and this had profound and significant implications because if one embeds these ideas within a uh, uh, these ideas with, and thoughts uh, uh, if one embeds these in his thought and practices, they assume a wholly different uh, uh, the wholly different meaning. Even anarchy did not, in the end, trouble him so much. When Gandhi, when Gandhi was desperate to avoid the partition of India, and the British were claiming that their imperial presence alone was the condition for retaining the unity of India, Gandhi said, in that case, leave us to our anarchy. In a sense, Gandhi embraced a form of anarchy, if one thinks of the world in which there is an absent absence of foundational assurances. I will draw out some of these implications and the constituent parts of this alternative framing. Alternative because, as I've said, it puts the social, the moral, self-discipline, and not the political at the center of his thought, which in turn were expressions of a deep attentiveness to the spiritual needs of the self. Courage, patience, toleration, religion, and more broad, and broadly, morality are the pillars and the central aspects of his vision and his spirituality. They are braided with his views on democracy, violence, fearlessness, and self-discipline. Gandhi refused for the most part, for the most part, the categories and terms in which the 20th century and with, with redoubled uh, zeal, the current era, had come to suffuse modern political discourse, especially imperial relations from both sides. He did not, for the most part, speak of exploitation, inequality, racism, differentials of power, the absence of political representation, economic miserization, or quotidian forms of violence, and the warrant and urgency of national independence, even though in different degrees, each of these mattered to him. Gandhi belongs to that lineage of thinkers and traditions, some ancient, some modern, that identified self-knowledge in terms like eschesis, the Greek term which etymologically links suffering with discipline, as does the sans Sanskrit term <coughs> parka, par, par sakara. Uh, which connotes discipline, self-discipline, and purification. These were the terms that mattered most to Gandhi, because they indicated a, con indicated a connection between self-discipline, suffering, purification, all of which were linked to interiority. None of them could be, could be just, could be had just for the asking. They all suggested depth rather than relying on, on the external gloss in which Gandhi's view was, in, in, which in Gandhi's view was like a garment that could be changed at will. Like, like Aristotle, Gandhi believed that repetition or habit form, formation had an essential link with character. What Gandhi was most concerned with was that they, <clears throat> was that they all had a crucial link with interiority. 
repetition, like spinning, was essential to his vision of a life lived within what was given, and hence, in some, in some sense, arbitrary. For Gandhi, moral behavior was not merely the, having the right intellectual con concepts, but, uh, but it was about seeing people with the eyes of the heart, seeing them in the fullness of experience, suffering with them, walking in their path. Morality was a matter of acute attentiveness to oneself and to others. Character was not automatic. It was a sensibility and a skill acquired slowly through small increments. Self-realization was similar. It too was a process which required effort over long durations. These were the parts of the general claim of a general claim of achieving self-realization, self-realization, seeing God face to face, moksha in uh, achieving moksha, in brief, achieving a spiritual goal. I elaborate this alternative vision in the various chapters of this book. They are all, they all have a link with actions. They all suggest how deep Gandhi's antipathy was in taking shortcuts and in thinking politically. For Gandhi, pain and suffering, even violence, were essential touchstones of, of, of spiritual progress. At numerous occasions, Gandhi said self-sacrifice, overcoming fear, endurance, self-discipline were all braided. Gandhi's conceptual importance and genius was in showing how deep, how deep the how deep the link was, how deep their link was to freedom, politics, and that too, without thinking in familiar political terms. Each of the chapters in this draft make basically the same point, because there are various attempts to make vivid Gandhi's critique of political rationality. And therefore, there is considerable repetition in these chapters. Their unity lies in the articulation of his spiritual vision. Thank you. moment to think. I can maybe start off and, and hopefully spur some thoughts. But in a conversation we had during the pandemic, mm -hmm. public conversation, you suggested that got for Gandhi and you weren't sure where you stood on it, that there may be, it may be a right to just not take public measures against the virus and let people die. Mm -hmm. And you weren't sure how you felt about that, but you thought that would have been Gandhi's approach. Um, earlier today in a conversation, you said that potentially faced with global warming, Gandhi's approach would be we don't need the, you know, let the earth die. That's not our priority. Our priority is acting responsibly, or I don't know, responsibly is the right word for self reflection, self growth. Mm -hmm. uh, growth from within, as you put it today, I think maybe part of a subtitle, who knows? Um, but I'm wondering to what extent there are limits. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, Hannah Arendt says, you have to defend truth at all costs because without truth, the world would die. Mm -hmm. But she says, justice, no, you can let justice go because mm -hmm. you need to keep the world Good. going. Yeah. Is there no need to keep the world going for Gandhi? Is that just totally outside of his perspective?
I think the short answer, hope. Oh. Or you can use this if you'd like. Ah, I'll use this one. I think the short answer is yes. There is no need to keep the world good. Um, but at least that's what I think Gandhi's answer would be. Um, uh, you know, as I said to you in that podcast, uh, you know, I'm not sure that would be my answer. I suspect it would not be. Um, uh, I value my life perhaps too much. Um, um, Do you think it should be your answer? Uh, I wish I could say it should be my answer. You do wish. I, I, but I, you know, I, I'm sufficiently self-aware. I don't have the courage to give that answer in, a, in an honest way. You know, I have not gone through uh, these various exercises, let's call them exercises, that uh, Gandhi says are necessary to have that outlook in which you come to value your life less than, let's say, in the Hobbesian mm -hmm. tradition. But, you know. But there's a distinction between valuing your life yeah. and valuing all life and yes. the world. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think the relevant thing is here is to invoke what I referred to at the beginning, what Gandhi says to the Jews. Uh, you must be prepared to die and not expect anyone to follow you. Uh, so, I don't know how, how, what's that code to set an example uh, and think through your example, others will follow you. I don't know. Uh, that's the best I can do. Uh, yes, uh, we're waiting for a microphone again. Follow up on you must be prepared to die, and and particularly the first quotation from Gandhi about um, um, that uh, uh, Jews must. Uh, uh, he wouldn't. If you want a dignified death, yeah. if you want to retain your dignity, yeah, but it has to be meaningful. Yes, but it does that. But that means it has to be meaningful for someone. I think what Gandhi if, has... If you, if you die, I mean, your death may be... It's odd then to think of your death as meaningful. I mean, presumably the quotation was designed to suggest it would be meaningful for others. And that suggests that the world should go on. I mean, there'd be others who would be able to derive meaning from this act. I don't think he means ah. to others. I think it must be meaningful to yourself. I see. That's, I mean, that's how I understand uh, Gandhi's emphasis on interiority. But it's not about how the world thinks about you. It's about how you think about yourself. Yeah. So no. it's the spirit in which you accept death. Yes. Yes. And I think that's why Uh, in the quotation that I referred to, or that I quoted um, from the beginning of the autobiography, what he's saying is what I have pined for these past 30 years is to see God face to face, to achieve moksha, which translates into salvation. Uh, uh, and all my public activities 
have been in the service of this goal to achieve moksha. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, he is that concerned with how he appears. I, I mean, somebody recently asked me uh, what I thought the essence of Gandhi was. And I said, I think he's a religious thinker. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, but the, the interesting thing is that unlike most religious thinkers, he has a conception of other people's religion and other people's religion gives them the language of self-understanding, self-knowledge. So it's not that he is a Hindu in any deep sense even though he often def defined himself, described himself as a Hindu. But he also said, I don't know, Jews have their own language of self-understanding and they have to be true to that. This is, this is really fascinating. And um, as you're speaking here, I'm thinking a lot about Tolstoy and I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the uh, second epilogue to War and Peace, the critique of political rationality there. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether you would comment for us on where you think if anywhere, Tolstoy and uh, Gandhi part ways on this critique of political rationality. Because the underlying suppositions in, for Tolstoy is of course that individual action is meaningless, even that even if people think, think otherwise, that the great man theory of history is ridiculous when mm -hmm. you look at history from the right perspective. And under those circumstances, the best possible human you can be is someone like, Platon Karatayev, who is living a very, he's a peasant who's living simply mm -hmm. and he's generous and kind under the worst possible circumstances. Mm -hmm. Is that Gandhi's critique or is there additional embroidery we, embroidery we need to make it whole? Mm. Uh, uh. There is uh, uh, a pretty famous situation where uh, uh, what in India we call Dalits today, um, what used to be called, you know, untouchables. Or, uh, some Dalit comes to him uh, and says, uh, um, I am being oppressed. And Gandhi says, um, just try and be the best Dalit you are. You can be. So he doesn't say, uh, think in hierarchical terms, try and move into another caste, you know, improve your lot. He just says, try and be the best of what you are. Um, I contrast that with uh, Ambedkar's uh, uh, comment uh, in, uh, in this book called The Annihilation of Caste, uh, in which uh, 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 Ambedkar's basic argument is um, the caste system is central to Hinduism. Central to the caste system is this idea of untouchability. Therefore, Hinduism has to be destroyed. Uh, he ends that book by saying, uh, you know, priests should be sanctioned by the state. So there should be a public service exam to decide who is a priest. 
So he makes the state central to the sanctioning of a religion. Gandhi's response is more or less uh, what I just said to you. If you are a cobbler, try and be the best kind of cobbler you can be. And now this is what makes Gandhi, for some, uh, unacceptably conservative. You know, I, 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 I think there's considerable truth to that. Uh, but, uh, and it's not that I have a different view, you know. Like I said to Roger, I, 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 you know, I, I'm just a normal guy. I value my life. I value planetary existence. But, you know, you know I find this alternative vision interesting, challenging, distinct. Karuna. Yeah. Raised by both these issues, it does seem that in the letter to Buber, before he gets to the point of, he does he says it often that one has to be prepared to die, yeah. a dignified death. That's the precondition of acting. Yeah, but it's also made in the service of saying Jews should act, not wait for anyone else, and they have to act if they want to be free or they want to challenge yeah. an idea of an exclusive ethnic idea of patriotism. They have to act. So I, I, I think I'm still, I still think there's a question about action. Yeah, and yeah. Coming back to the other, the other probably very controversial set of writings that Gandhi made was about the Bihar earthquakes. Yes, coming back yes, to the yes. question of Antashvili. So the argument with Tagore was that he said the earthquake was, I feel it as a sin against yeah. untouchability. Yeah. So I think there, so I guess the question about untouchability there would be, so I guess this was the way I'd pose it. Gandhi, doesn't Gandhi's idea of interiority mm -hmm. become one in which one is responsible for a lot? So it's a very demanding mm -hmm. act. So it's precisely because Gandhi thinks that in some way he is responsible yeah, yeah. For, for sins in the world yeah. that requires atonement, transformation, yeah. Yeah. et cetera. So I guess, it, again, I guess I would say one emphasis on interiority um, the emphasis on interiority can lead uh, to a kind of passivity, mm. but it can also lead to intensity yes. of the demand. And I guess I'm curious where you, you again, you emphasize in a way the acceptance. And I'm curious how you, how we can put the intensity of that sense of responsibility that comes from a kind of expansive, like sense of interiority in some ways. Does that make sense? Is yeah, question? yeah, yeah. I mean, the other example is, um, uh, uh, I think it was his niece. Um, um, who had appendicitis. And uh, Gandhi thought it was his fault. What? <laughs> What? You think her appendicitis is your fault? Uh, and uh, I feel uh, when I read this, I, 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 I said, what is analogous to this? And uh, the only thing I could come up with um, was um, Uh, this statement, I am my brother's keeper. So I'm responsible for my brother. Uh, no, you know, uh, uh, and as you know, Tagore found uh, Gandhi's explanation uh, for the Bihar earthquake utterly implausible utterly implausible. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 yeah, he, he, he felt he was responsible, you know, um, uh, that, uh, you know, um, I mean, uh, 
I honestly don't know how to make sense of these comments. Um, um, uh, the, other than some bizarre notion of the fact that we are all connected in some invisible sense, you know, uh, that there is some kind of uh, non-evident form of connection, you know. Uh, do I find it persuasive? No, I don't know if I find it persuasive. Uh, uh, yeah. This, in a sense, speaks to my question, which is um, the use of rationality yeah. as as the, the the thing that's being critiqued. Yeah. And is the rational is the rationality really sort of um, synonymous, really, with instrumentality here? Could it, it or is it meant to be um, opposite to spirituality, or is there a sort of irrationality, which something like believing that. I caused the earthquake um, might might link to. I, I'm just curious about the choice to focus this as a critique of political rationality and what that is supposed to encompass. So uh, the critique of political rationality is a critique of the four things I listed that are central to modern political rationality. The fact that politics is concerned with the relations between people and states, the fact that it has to be instrumental, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the state cannot have a principled take on violence, uh, and the fact that uh, states have to be responsible for the improvement of the world. Um, uh, so it, it's more than rationality. I think it's the compendium that constitutes modern rationality, modern political rationality. And Gandhi is critical of that. Um, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I just I was thinking about just the use of that rhetoric of rationality. Yeah. Um, as is that meant to kind of be code for enlightenment reason? Um, is does it have another connotation? And and is gone, are we supposed to be getting a type of um, more and more? It sounds like the religious and the spiritual are really meant to kind of challenge the dominance of either like of secular rationality in this. Yeah. Um, I'll have to think about that more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this might be the last question. Oh, really? Yes, um, dear Clement, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, or should I read it out? The floor is yours. Fine, you can read it out. That's fine. You can read it out. Thank you. So the question is from Dr. Clement uh, Akpang. Um, do you think that Gandhi was against bounded or collective modern political rationality? Uh, I, I, I don't know the difference. You want to comment that? Or reformulate your question? Okay, let me just, let me re reformulate it, that's right. You don't have to write it, you can ask directly. We hear you in the room. 
All right, so, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful exposition. So there's, a, there's, a, there's listening to the, your presentation about Gandhi and some of his comments, uh, it appears to me that uh, Gandhi promotes some sense of um, nationalism uh, within a, a, a particular sphere as opposed to a, a collective uh, um, political rationalism where a group, a particular group can control the thinking of different nations. That's why I asked that question. If you think that Gandhi was against bounded um, modern uh, political rationalism. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've often been asked versions of what I take your question to be. Uh, and uh, my typical answer, which I'll restate here, is I don't think of Gandhi as a nationalist. Uh, because uh, a typical nationalist cares about boundaries, borders, uh, defense of borders, um, most importantly, a central state that does this defending. None of these things were important to Gandhi. Uh, I don't think, I mean, he was once asked, um, uh, what is India? And his answer was uh, revealing. He said, there is India in East Africa. There is India in Aden. There is India in South Africa. And you would think he was asked, he was asked the question, what is what are Indians? Or where are Indians? That was not the question. It is, what is India? He gave this completely, or what appeared to be, a ridiculous answer. There is India in Aden. There is India in East Africa. There is India in South Africa. And when you think about it, um, what I think this suggests is he just didn't think in terms of the nation state. At least that's my understanding of that answer. Thank you. Um, please join me in thanking Professor Uday Mehta for a wonderful lecture today. Thank you, Uday. Thank you, Roger. Fine. No, yeah. <laughs>